Hi, everyone. Good morning. Thank you so much for coming uh, to Ethics Grand Rounds. I'm Maureen Kelly from the Truman Katz Center. Um, just a couple of announcements this morning before we launch into our topic. Um, our bioethics conference, our annual conference, will be on July 18th and 19th. And we're going back full circle. This is our 10th uh, anniversary, so we're going back to the topic that we started with, was, which was pediatric res research ethics. And we have some really great speakers, and we hope you'll be able to come down to Bell Harbor and join our conference this summer. I also wanted to thank our ongoing supporters, Deb Godfrey and Jeff Sconyers, for supporting this series very generously. And a reminder that um, for this, for these ethics cases, this is based on a number of real cases, but we change details to protect the patients and the families. So some of you might recognize bits and pieces of a situation that you remember, but we've um, really tried to mix things up. So we're trying to raise an issue that has been troubling um, the child protection team and also has come to the ethics service. The title was deliberately provocative, and our first speaker will say something to clarify this particular uh, concept or term. The old term was Munchausen's, um, and this is a special kind of child abuse, which uh, both of our speakers will say a little bit more about. It's really surrounding an escalation of care, an escalation of services or treatments when there is no underlying illness and when that illness has been fabricated. And so we're focusing on a fairly narrow issue, but I think it raises a broader question, and that is um, parenting and the assessment of parenting is a critical and integral part of child abuse investigations, which often begin here in the hospital since you all are the sentinels. And what happens is, um, you know, parenting has, happens in many different domains, and it's really spilled over onto the Internet. And so the question we're looking at today is when parenting of a concerning sort in cases of caregiver fabricated illness or medical child abuse is evidenced in blogging, in parent blogging, what is the obligation of the team to investigate that blogging activity? What happens when they stumble upon it? So you'll see in our case that this issue is really challenging for the care providers involved in, in, in the particular child we'll be talking about. So our speakers today uh, presenting this particular issue in the case will be James Metz, uh, Dr. James Metz, and he's attending physician here at Seattle Children's, at Providence, and Evergreen Hospitals. Um, he is also a member of the child protection team, so I think it'd be really valuable to have that perspective. From the child protection team, we also have senior social worker Anna Brown, um, who is very involved in a series of cases raising this issue, and we're really looking forward to her insights. As our commentator uh, this time, we have uh, in-house talent. We have Dr. Megan Moreno. Uh, Megan is Associate Professor in Adolescent Medicine here at the University of Washington and at Seattle Children's. Uh, she, um, she focuses on ways in which technology can be used towards improving adolescent health with particular focus on social media. She's lead investigator of the Social Media and Adolescent Health Research Team, or SMART, and she'll say a little bit more about that program during her comments. So thank you for our speakers, and uh, presenting the case will be Dr. Metz. So um, just before I present the case, I wanted to, now that we've lured you all here with a provocative title, uh, Munchausen by uh, proxy or by internet, I wanted to actually change the title. Um, <laughs> or, or actually at least um, uh, provide you with an update on the terminology because it is a, um, a, a term that we don't use as much. Um, it was first developed in 1977 by an uh, English pediatrician, uh, Roy Meadow. And it really focuses on the perpetrator or person uh, causing the abuse. Um, and we've, we've tried to get away from that and use new terminology such as medical child abuse, which was developed by uh, Tom Russler and, and Carol Jenny, who are here today. Um, or uh, as the AAP likes to um, uh, call it, caregiver fabric fabricated illness, which takes the focus off the person committing the abuse um, and more focus on the child being abused. So it might seem like a subtle difference, but actually it's an important distinction to make. Um, because while pediatricians are qualified to diagnose the child being abused, 
they're much less convincing to courts and judges when we start trying to diagnose the perpetrator uh, or interpret the motivation of the adults uh, causing the abuse. So um, from, the, from now on we'll be using the, and hopefully you all will be using the term medical child abuse or caregiver fabricated illness. So now, so now on to the case. The case is, um, again, it's an amalgamation of, of what we see uh, fairly frequently in the uh, child protection program. And it's of a two and a half year old child who was born at 36 weeks uh, at 2,500 grams um, to a G6P1 mother with a history of four prior late fetal deaths. The pregnancy was complicated by intermittent bleeding and vomiting. Uh, and baby required one week of NICU stay for poor feeding and prematurity. At three weeks of age, uh, the patient was seen by the primary care provider and reported to have emesis, irritability, arching, and coughing. Uh, as often happens, the baby was started on ranitidine. At five weeks of age, the child was admitted for a workup of the continued vomiting and diagnosed with uh, reflux disease and started on uh, elemental formula, thickened feeds, <coughs> placed on a wedge, and PPIs. At two months of age, uh, due to the intractable vomiting and poor weight gain, the patient was readmitted and had an upper GI and a pH probe which were normal. The patient was taken for a Nissen and was, uh, had a gastrostomy tube placed uh, after failed NG and NJ <coughs> trials uh, per mom's report. Patient continued to have complaints, or the patient's mom continued to complain of spitting up and fussiness at home with new reports of apnea and constipation. Patient was seen multiple times in the emergency department for fevers and wheezing, but the emergency department records never show that the patient had any respiratory distress as the mother was reporting. At nine months of age, there was concern for abnormal trunk tone and delayed motor skills and weakness. And at one year of age, the uh, patient was reported to have staring spells and apparent loss of tone. The workup included an MRI, an EEG, which were all normal, uh, but Kepra was started for possible seizures. The patient complaint, uh, had complaints of noisy breathing at night and had a sleep study which was equivocal, was started on home oxygen and had an oxygen monitor uh, initiated. And mother reported frequently having to dial up the oxygen uh, because the uh, patient frequently desaturated. Uh, patient had a tonsillectomy adenoidectomy. And because of all this, they were trying to find uh, a unifying diagnosis for the uh, failure to thrive and possible seizures. Uh, a metabolic workup was initiated, uh, which was all normal. It included a muscle biopsy and a mito map. Uh, despite this, a mitochondrial uh, cocktail was initiated. And the patient was noted in the medical records here at, uh, at the hospital to have good weight gain while in the hospital. Um, at 18 months of age, the patient uh, had a central line place for parental nutrition. And as expected, um, or as happens often, the patient was readmitted for enterococcal bacteremia. Um, and the central line was pulled, but was uh, planned to be reinserted after the antibiotic course. So the primary care provider seeing all this uh, got concerned because she didn't see the child as that sick and called the child protection team to discuss the possibility of medical child abuse. You can all sigh, that was a lot. Um, <laughs> but, it, it, and while it's an amalgamation, it actually is not far off from the truth. Okay, great. <coughs> bear with me with my skills here on the Oh, okay. Okay. So um, this is when our team became involved in this case. A mom shares with her favorite hospital therapist that she has a blog online about her child and invites her to view it. The therapist accesses the blog and the child is represented as much sicker than he appears in the hospital. 
the language is dramatic and does not match information that was shared by the care team. On the blog, uh, the therapist is also alarmed to note that mother has contacted Make-A-Wish on her own due to the child's intractable downhill course. And mom and dad are also using the blog to fundraise for their child's medical needs. The child has insurance and medical expenses are covered. Mother represents herself as the long-suffering and sacrificing parent of a child with unique fatal illness that the doctors can't diagnose. So, um, examples supporting caregiver fabric fabricated illness in blog content. So, um, one of the things that we have found that is a common thread in these types of blogs is blog content that contradicts physician statements and the child's actual medical findings. So, representing a diagnosis that the child has not been given or information that's been shared with the parent inaccurately online. Um, also, fundraising is another concern. So the child is not seriously ill, but the parent is raising money online for uh, different kinds of needs um, that, uh, that, that the team feels is, is unusual. Um, one of the things that we've also found that is fairly common in these types of blogs are graphic images of the child's medical therapies. Um, so pictures of uh, children, um, Partially, partially undressed with IVs, cannulas, um, pictures of them in their hospital room, pictures of children undergoing medical therapies. One of the other things that we've noted is a dramatic narrative focused on the parents' needs and sacrifices when the child is not actually ill. So long, long, long narratives about um, the hardship of the parent in caring for the child. So um, within our team, when we when we discovered the the um, when we discovered this kind of behavior in our suspected medical child abuse cases, one of the things that we we talked about was who should be looking at the blogs and if we should be doing this at all. Um, we felt that it was appropriate in cases of medical child abuse for us to access public blogs online and that it's something that the social work social workers on the team would do. Um, and since we started doing this a couple years ago, the State Medical Quality Assurance Commission has also agreed with us that it is appropriate for social work staff on the team to do that. Um, and it is part of our assessment, it's part of our evaluation now that we do uh, look, look for the blog and look at the content and it helps us make decisions about risk for the kids. We've looked at enough of these over the past couple of years that we do see the trends and the tone that I talked about in the previous slides um, with a lot of them. And that informs some of our protective decision making. I think that's. Is this mine? So um, a series of cases were brought to the ethics team um, and these are the issues that were discussed and really are still open-ended and we wanted to raise for you um, before Megan comments and before our Q&A. The first was what, under what conditions, if any, is it ever appropriate for members of the medical team or child protection team to view a parent blog? Um, and a lot of people on the team were troubled with it and wrestled with when, how, and who should it be. The other question was how should the team interpret and act on what they find in the blog? How should the scan team handle the gray area cases where it's not clear that this has risen to the level of medical child abuse? How much weight should be given to the blogs in a medical child abuse investigation when considering all the other details and facts? Does it matter more if you've got a full case clearly supporting medical child abuse and this is one additional thing that tips you over the balance. What if it's just the first indication and somebody else on the team stumbles upon the parent blog and has concerns? The third issue is whether accessing a blog undermines the parent family privacy and in turn families trust in the institution and in the providers and that's something we're obviously deeply concerned about and hope we can discuss during Q&A. So now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Moreno.
Thank you all so much for being here this morning. I think before I talk a little bit about thoughts on this case, I wanted to give you a sense of where I'm coming from. I'm an adolescent medicine physician and I'm a researcher. I'm fortunate to be the principal investigator of um, our research team, which we call SMART or SMOT, if you're from Boston. Um, and really our mission is to advance society's understanding of the relationships between media and adolescent health towards educating adolescents, providing better care, and really developing innovations in how we think about adolescent health care. And towards that mission, we have a certain set of values we follow. One of our values is an interdisciplinary approach. Social media, media, adolescent health really draws from many different fields, social work, educators, and we work with a lot of them on our team to review our projects and our research questions. And we have an emphasis on using ethical and sound research practices. When we do studies, we sometimes, actually often, are viewing adolescents' Facebook pages, adolescents' Twitter feeds, and so it's really critical to us to understand and develop methods that are really ethical and sound and that have informed consent on the part of our adolescent participants and their parents. Towards that end, we also partner with other researchers, educators, clinicians, and community members in the development and translation of we, what we learn from these social media projects and we work within a diverse and collaborative research team. So that's really the angle at which I'm coming into this discussion. Coming back to the questions posed by this case, when is it appropriate for members of the medical or child protection team to view a parent blog? I thought we'd discuss a little bit about privacy. Different types of sites, different types of online venues have different expectations and have different privacy settings, and whether or not you receive an invitation to view a site really matters. For the second question, how should the team interpret and act on the information in the blog, I thought we could discuss a little about how do other professional groups approach this same question. And I think too that we could touch on our legal, the legal profession and when we're hiring and looking at job applicants. And then third, does accessing a blog undermine parent and family privacy and in turn families trust in the institution or providers? And I think we should talk a little bit about family trust in clinical care, thinking about other stigmatizing information that we as healthcare providers often ask our parents and patients to provide us. And also consider a heavy question of what are the ethics of not looking? So let's start with talking about privacy. Different sites have different expectations. We'll start with Twitter. Twitter's pretty straightforward. Profile owners share short textual information limited to 140 characters, which are called tweets, with others in an ongoing, continuously updated feed. If you tweet it, it's out there immediately. And if you look at the privacy statement on the Twitter website, it says, our services are primarily designated to help you share information with the world. Our default is almost always to make the information you provide public, but we generally give you settings to make the information more private if you want. Your public information is broadly and instantly disseminated. Pretty clear cut that we're talking about something very public, but you could set it a little private if you want to. But they're telling you the culture of this site is public. And you can set privacy settings, you can be asked to follow or to follow someone else, but really those privacy statements make it clear that this is a, a site that is public, your information instantaneously goes to a global audience. So let's turn to Facebook. Facebook is a little different. Facebook allows profile owners to create an online profile. It includes displayed personal information. You can post text, video, surveys, photographs. You're building an online social network. You're friending other profile owners. You're communicating with them via messaging. And Facebook's privacy, set, privacy language is a little different. It talks about the rules if you are going to look at Facebook pages of other people. And the rules include that if you collect information from users, you will obtain their consent, you will make clear that it is you and not Facebook collecting their information, and you will post your own privacy policy explaining what information you collect and how you will use it. So much more nuanced language, much more of an expectation of privacy. And I think Facebook users will tell you that they use it in a way that they're expecting or assuming that there are some privacy protections in place. 
The profile owner can select their privacy settings. It can be all public. It can be all private. It can be customizable where certain parts of the site are public to some people. Other parts are private. Adolescents can set it so that their parents don't see anything. There's very customizable settings that give you a sense of empowerment that you're protecting your information. And you can update or change those at any time. And access is only by an accepted invitation. So a very different set of rules that suggest more privacy. Now, how about blogs? A blog is a discussion or information site that is considered something that is published. It is considered to be published on the web and consisting of these discrete entities. Blogs get updated daily, weekly, monthly, depending on who the blogger is. The majority of blogs are interactive, which means visitors can leave comments or messages, and that's what distinguishes a blog from a static website where you would go just to look at information. There's that potential for interactivity, which really presents a culture that this is a site that is public and that the blogger is willing to interact with you. In some discussions, people will describe blogging as a form of social networking. And some other descriptions say that bloggers devote a significant time not only to, for producing content for others to read, watch, or listen to, but also paying attention to and interacting. So I think the key thing here is the producing content for others to read. This is usually um, compared to diaries, but blogging is really about producing something that you are publishing for other people to read. Most blogs, by definition, are created for public viewing. There are some private blogs that are created and protected and used just within families. But what we're really talking about is blogs that anybody in this room could access. And the standard is to have a blog open for reading and that viewers and followers will find you. The idea of reaching out and extending a specific invitation to read a blog or asking someone to follow your blog really requires an act an active communication on the part of the blogger. So how do other professional groups handle information gained through viewing personal online sources? Let's start with the legal profession. So under the Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution, individuals are protected from government searches when and where they have a reasonable expectation of privacy. So that expectation is limited by what society recognizes as reasonable, given the circumstances of the individual at the time of the search. So for example, courts have held that an individual has a reasonable expectation of privacy within your own home, but you do not have a reasonable expectation of privacy in things that you knowingly expose to the public. So if you engage in some sort of criminal act in a public park, you are not subject to these privacy limitations. So how has the legal profession approached different sites? And I'll use Facebook, for example, because as we saw in the privacy expectations, Facebook actually has the highest expectation that the content is private. So federal and state courts have examined Facebook's privacy policy and determined that individuals do not have a reasonable expectation of privacy in information they post on their pages, regardless of what your own privacy setting is. And I think this can be well illustrated through this case of Romano versus Steelcase. So this is a uh, company, Steelcase Manufacturing, um, and the defendant is Romano. The court granted Steelcase's request to access the private information on Facebook, holding that Romano did not have a reasonable expectation of privacy in information that she published on social networking websites. So taking a step back, essentially what happened is that Romano had claims that she was injured at work and that she was on um, disability payments from Steelcase. She posted on her Facebook page photos of her going jogging. And the courts held that that information was admissible in court. And the court noted that Facebook privacy policies <laughs> plainly state that information users post may be shared with others, and that information sharing is the very nature and purpose of these social networking sites or else they would cease to exist and we would all go back to writing in our diaries. <laughs> so courts have concluded that a person has no reasonable expectation of privacy in writings that the person posts on a social networking website and makes available. And another court concluded that users would logically lack an illegitimate expectation of privacy in materials intended for publication or public posting. And this has become a generally accepted principle of law. So again, we're talking about Facebook where 
users have the assumption or illusion or delusion of privacy. And we're not talking about sites such as Twitter and blogs, which really clearly have language all over the web, all over the place, that those are private sites, public sites. So how do other professional groups handle information gained through viewing personal online sources? I think it's easy to say that many businesses now screen applicants' online presence before making hiring decisions. And I think in many circles, the idea that you would hire someone on to, into a business, into a permanent staff, a high-level position, without Googling them is often considered to be a somewhat foolish practice in today's world. On my research team, we spend a lot of time looking at Facebook profiles and looking for adolescents who talk about health risk behaviors, things like drinking. If we we are bringing on a new staff and their Facebook profile is public and it's completely covered with pictures of drinking, that to us would suggest a lack of attention to detail and perhaps not someone that we might be really wanting to recruit to our team. I think it's what many, many places are doing and I think that this is happening across many different fields. So let's talk a little bit about family trust and clinical care because now that we've talked through the idea that these sites are public, that there's a general expectation that they're public across different fields, I think we need to come back to our really, really privileged role as healthcare providers in how does this impact our relationship with families. So I think a couple things we could think about are other stigmatizing information we collect that may be unrelated to our patient's immediate care and then what are some of the thoughts or ethics of not looking. So I think when we think about other stigmatizing information that we collect in the context of a clinical visit, and this is particularly true, I would say, in adolescent medicine, we often collect very personal, very private, possibly stigmatizing information that to the patient might feel unrelated to their illness. I think great examples would be sexual history, substance use history. We screen almost all patients in many settings for domestic violence. So if I'm a 14-year-old young lady and I have a stomach virus and I come to the emergency room and people start asking me about sexual history, I might not understand why they're asking me that, why they're asking me these really personal and embarrassing questions, but this is something that we do when we really want to understand all of the factors that might be playing into a patient's given illness. And I think these questions, they have the potential to annoy people, to confuse people, to offend people, to alarm people, but we really convey to our patients that this, our priority is their safety, our priority is their health, and in our adolescent clinics, we talk to patients about confidentiality and that the information we're collecting, we will keep confidentially and that we will protect. So I think there are other clinical areas where we collect information that to some patients may seem confusing or unrelated or personal, but we talk to them about why we do that and that we will keep their information safe. I think it's also important to recognize that we ask patients about their internet use and media use. The American Academy of Pediatrics uh, rec recommends that we screen all patients for media use using two media use screener questions. These are health topics that come up in our interactions with patients and families. They're not outside the sphere of healthcare in terms of talking to them about what they're doing online, what they're seeing online. And I think it's also reasonable to think that in some diagnoses, we go outside of the family unit to try to get additional information to help us make a diagnosis. And one example would be in cases in which we're considering the diagnosis of ADHD, we often reach out and partner with schools and get information from teachers and from counselors to help us make that diagnosis. So I think families are used to us asking challenging questions. Sometimes they're used to ask us asking them whether we can go to other sources to get information that will help us solve the mystery of a case. So in summary, I think there are some precedents that may support <coughs> seeking publicly posted information from blogs about a patient's health and safety, so long as we handle this information in the same way that we handle any patient data. So what is a blog about a child's health? It's considered a public document. It could be considered a published document. It's open access, and it's discussing a child's health. 
So I think some of the more challenging questions are then, what are the ethics of not looking? What are the ethics of knowing that information might be there and not accessing it? Or waiting until a case gets to the point that it's in a legal situation, where in the legal situation we know that there will be no question that they will access it. And does it matter how we get to that blog? If we're invited to look at the blog, is that something different than if we find it or stumble onto it? And is that different than if we go purposefully seeking it? I don't have the answers to those questions, but I think it's worth thinking about are we liable if we don't seek this information, given how much we've learned about the information that's available and out there, and about society's general expectations that this information is public and published. So at this point, I'll stop, and I'm hoping that people have a lot of questions and discussion points. Thank you so much. And just to remind you, there are two mics, and if the first person who comes up would switch it on, and it um, switches on the top. And you can ask questions, either of the details of the case um, or Megan's comment, so any of us can come up and answer. Well, uh, Megan, that was, that was terrific. Um, and of course, your last slide was the most provocative one, and so I do want to just you know, try to help ask you a little more about your thoughts about that, particularly I think the very important issue that you raise about the distinction between invitations, finding, and seeking. Um, you know, I, th I think you, that's a very nice demarcation, and clearly, obviously, the invitation is the easiest one. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering if you have any thoughts specifically about the other two, because I think this comes up in many other contexts as well. Mm -hmm. I, I think in terms of, of if you find it, if you stumble onto it, that's almost in an easier category as well. I think the really tricky one is do we go seeking it? And I think that when I present this idea to groups such um, as educators and legal professionals, their, their answer is yes, you look. If you're worried about a kid, you look. And you use the same tools that we all use to find a condo in Miami. You use Google. And you put in a name or you put in um, the kid's name and you look to see whether there's information that's worrisome to you. And I think the key here is what we're talking about is public information, which is published in a sense. And I think maybe another analogy to reach to is the web has become kind of our daily newspaper. And if we were worried about a patient and their parent was being featured in a newspaper story, we would have no qualms about reading that newspaper story about our patients. So some people have suggested the analogy that what's on the web in public is essentially yesterday's newspaper. Um, and that maybe seeking in those gray cases when we're trying to determine whether there's something out there that should trigger starting an investigation, I think it's something reasonable to think about. Yes. So uh, I, I want to uh, uh, note that the Steele case uh, decision really had um, uh, dealt with evidence that was directly relevant to the work mm -hmm. comp claim. They're pictures of uh, behavior that's inconsistent with the claim that was being made. And one of my questions for you is, you've, you've used the term information repeatedly to describe what's on these sites. And I don't believe that's necessarily an accurate term. Uh, what we have are postings. And they may or may not be related to objective reality as observed by anybody else. Uh, and that's the problem with yesterday's newspaper as well. I've unfortunately had uh, a fair number of media interactions over the years, and they get things, uh, by and large, somewhere between 50 to 65 percent right. Uh, they don't get it all right. I've never seen a story that I've had any involvement with that got it all right. And so uh, what I wonder is, uh, having access, and I, I agree that uh, it's uh, appropriate in some cases to take a look at what people have posted on these uh, accessible sites. Uh, how do you distinguish between something that is uh, objectively true in anybody's eyes, uh, perhaps exaggerated uh, through the lens of parental anxiety and lack of understanding of the med medical profession, fabricated, falsified? I have a 22-year-old uh, who says, uh, when, uh, when you read my Facebook, page, Dad. Don't, uh, don't take it too literally. 
I think that's a great point. So, and I think you're, it's such an insightful question. And I think, to me, it sounds like what you're essentially act, asking is, <laughs> is sort of what is truth. And I think that when we think about what's online, what we choose to represent about ourselves online, it's just as subject to our own perceptions and misperceptions as any other document. So how many people in the room have their accurate weight on their driver's license? <laughs> how many people have reviewed a CV of someone and saw things that might have been squeaked a little bit? I think many of us have many documents and many many places in which we put information about ourselves that are sometimes massaged in different ways. And Facebook is a great example. Facebook has been described in some ways as a social resume. It's your social online resume. And so it's likely representative of a lot of truths about you, but it's certainly not the whole you. So I think that in if we were to think about taking information online, and I still see it as information, I don't say it's necessarily all true information, but if we take that information into a case, I think we need to treat it as something that may be a red flag. It may indicate risk. When we do studies and we look at adolescents <coughs> displaying references to substance use, alcohol, depression symptoms, we think of those as red flags, red flags that we would want to follow up on with self-report, not as a diagnosis or diagnostic criteria. Um, so I think that it's information that we can use, but it's not make or break information. It's not going to necessarily be the absolute truth. It's information that that person who posted it has voluntarily decided to make public from their perception of how they think things are. And I think your point is such a good one in this, converse, in this context of these cases is these, this information can give us insight into parents' perceptions of what they think is going on and their views on how they think things may or may not be happening. So it can help us, but it, it's not usually going to be a make or break. Great point. Um, yes. I would like to focus on the issue of does it matter if it's anxiety, if it's fabrication, if it's exaggeration, or if it's an inducement? And I would say that's the wrong question. My, or that's the wrong question to ask. The right question is, is this child suffering? And you look at this child who's 18 months old, who's been starved for 18 months, whose development is delayed because of starvation, who has a hole in her belly, who has a hole in her chest, who is uh, at risk for very severe sepsis, this child was suffering for 18 months. She didn't have the joy of sitting down and having a, a jar of baby food. Uh, and we have to think about what our role in that is and take responsibility for that. Um, so I don't think we're asking the right question. The other thing I'd like to say in terms of about seeking versus finding, in any child abuse case, we seek. Uh, if a child comes in with facial bruising and they're six month old, they get a CT scan, even if they have a normal neuro exam, they get a skeletal survey, and in about 20, 25% of the cases, we find other injury. And that helps us deal with the, the history that the child got hit in the face when the jungle gym, the, the play gym, fell down on their face from the crib. So, mm -hmm. so we seek all the time, and in fact, we have a, a, HIPAA, um, a HIPAA exemption so that seeking is legal for those of us who do this work. I really thank you for those comments, and I think it helps us come back to grounding what, what, we're, what, what is really at the core of this discussion is how can we think about these tools and using them in an ethical way, but do these tools allow us a new way to identify children who are suffering <coughs> earlier? And I think one way that I sometimes think about the tools that social media and technology provide us is that many, unfortunately, many cases of child abuse have been going on for generations and decades, and adolescent risky behaviors have been going on for millennia. And so social media and some of these tools, they provide us this new way to view old behaviors. It's almost like getting a new lens on an old camera. So it's a new tool, it's a tool in our bag, but it's not the only tool. It's a complement to the methods that you mentioned that we're already doing to try to investigate cases. So I thank you for your comments. Yes. Hi, I'm Tom Ressler. I'm the mild-mannered partner to uh, Carol Jenny. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and I've had an intimate relationship with at least one pediatrician for a long time. 
I'd like to talk about treatment. And as a child psychiatrist, I've been involved in treatment of uh, literally hundreds of cases of medical child abuse. And the difficulty is creating a therapeutic partnership with the family. Because if you really want to treat these kids and send them home to their families, what you have to do is essentially reestablish a therapeutic medical doctor-patient relationship which functions on the behalf of the child. This information that we have here talks, as you spoke uh, uh, just now, has to do with the parent's belief system. It shows a belief system that really is very distorted and is functioning to the detriment of the child. And if we want to treat that child within the context of their family, what we need to have is the information that this kind of material gives, but also that we get from the medical chart. Just as a reminder to everybody, we have this implicit assumption that the doctor-patient relationship is following the rules. We have this assumption that parents give us accurate information. We have this assumption that they're not giving us false leads, taking us various directions. That's not always true. And it is our responsibility as physicians to monitor the doctor-patient relationship. We're the ones who have to say, wait a minute here, does the information I'm getting match the picture, the clinical picture I'm seeing? And if not, it's our responsibility to question that. And it's our responsibility to go back to the parents and say, um, excuse me, um, you know, can we kind of go back a step and see what we're doing here? Uh, uh, we would like to renegotiate this contract we have with you. I think this kind of information, although in 90% of the cases that people are going to see, they're not going to have people who blog. They're going to have much less uh, obvious uh, indications. But when we have information like this, this is something that says, whoa, wait a minute, stop. We have to go back to this parent and say, what are you doing? You know, uh, how can we help your child? Thank you so much. I think that's an outstanding point, and that's a point that comes up in some of our research studies as well. I mentioned that we conduct studies where we, with consent of participants, look at Facebook pages, and we're interested in disclosures about mental health, about substance use. And we've done studies where we've worked with those same older adolescents and asked them, is this information fair game for people to talk to you? If someone saw this information that you can't remember how you got home last night, how would you want them to talk to you about it? And it's in exactly the ways you mentioned that what we've learned from our research is that adolescents generally would like to be approached, they would like to be informed that someone had seen the information, and they'd like to be asked if they're okay and asked if they can talk about it not putting in a judgment, I saw this, therefore it's true. I saw this, why the heck did you put that there? I saw this, I'm taking you in because you are clearly this or that. They want to be approached and said, I found this online. I'd like to check in and know how you're doing. And let's talk about this. How, tell me about what you posted. Tell me about how you're doing. So I think that we can think about that in many of these cases as well. I found this information. It was public. I'm a little worried about you and how your family's doing. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about what we've seen and why we're worried. So I think your point is a great one. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Anne Marie, Amy Schlager from Gynecology. So I have a question about the longevity of these blogs, right? Mm -hmm. So these children are having this information that there's, that's their private medical information posted by their parents in a public forum, and they're gonna grow up. And then they're gonna be adolescents and adults. And so just as you were describing, you know, Googling your own future hires, you know, these are gonna have, they're gonna have potentially future employers or colleges who are gonna look back and then see pictures of these kids who are you know, now 18, 19, but now have pictures of them half naked on the internet. And so I'm wondering about how do we educate parents about these blogs because they're essentially violating the privacy of their child and they're impacting their child's future. Um, and I wonder if there have been any repercussions that we've seen legally for adults or teens going back and potentially you know, criticizing their parents in a, in a public or legal format where they've actually violated their privacy of information. I think you raise an excellent point, which, which is really good for all of us to reflect on, is we're talking about the impact of this blog on a case, but I think stepping back and saying, and, and I think great points about the blog identifying ways to identify kids who are suffering, what about later on? What about 20 years from now when that kid's trying to get into college and that blog or those pictures or that content is still around? I think um, we're in a very interesting point as a society because we as adults 
are using these technological tools and learning them is the same time as our children are growing up. And so I don't know how many of you on Facebook have seen a friend post a picture of their child's cute little naked bottom at six months. I mean, these are the pictures that we all hid when our boyfriends came over when we were adolescents <laughs> that our parents had in albums. And it was mortifying that they were in albums. And now those pictures are going to be all over Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. So I think that you raise an excellent question, which is, as a society, how do we think about this line of public and private, not just for ourselves, but for our own children? And what kind of legacy that we're leaving for them? Because these days, a child's digital footprint is really starting with those first Facebook posts of that child being born in the hospital. So I think you raise a great question that I don't have the answer to. Um, the legal profession has talked, um, been working with uh, the computer science uh, profession and talking about whether there's some way to embed cookies um, in postings for kids who are under the age of 18, such that those postings would, would detonate when they're 18. I think it's a really neat idea, and we certainly have a lot of technology to think about those things, but we're certainly not there yet. So I think that we're in this struggle where we're all trying to learn to use these new tools, and we might not be role modeling the best behaviors for our own kids. Add something to that? Sure. So, um, what I want to add to that is just that we know that parents blog about children with legitimate illness, and people choose to represent their children online in all kinds of different ways, whether it's a CaringBridge site or a blog that they create. And I think that that's a separate ethical discussion about how people are choosing to represent um, their children online in cases of real illness. We're, we're talking about blogging with, with um, content that's not accurate or not true. And the other thing that I want to add to that is one of the things that that's the difference between a blog that is just a place where a parent goes and vents and makes something up. You can do anything you want online, but when your child has co-occurring real documented symptoms that you're talking about online that aren't well explained at the hospital, that, that is where we see the <coughs> blogs as tremendously useful. So we recognize that parents are anxious. We recognize that people create blogs for children with illness. It's how people communicate. It's how people get support. I'm sure there are many people in this room who have friends or family who've had blogs during illness. So we respect that and we recognize that. This is a different, this is a different type of behavior. So um, it, as far as the online content, there are going to be thousands of children who have, have real illness, real childhood illness, whose parents are choosing to blog. And that's, that's a separate a separate conversation, I think, so. Megan, thank you uh, for another great talk. Uh, like Dr. Jenny, it was, it was sort of painful to see the long time in diagnosing this child and having to use social media to get, get to help, find help for the child. And so it, we're talking about a technology, and it's really important to, to recognize the, that we have a serious problem in chi child maltreatment. Mm -hmm. But going back to the technology, uh, there is a, a maybe a fourth bullet, and I was trying to figure out, and that is a, like absorbing it, or you've written a lot about cyberbullying. A lot of mm -hmm. child maltreatment occurs in dysfunctional families. There could be two blogs. Uh, people accuse each other of things. Uh, uh, we in the medical profession are often accused of maltreatment of our patients and how do we, we can't respond to that. So, so I mean, I wonder if you could comment about the reliability, the use of, of social media as a weapon in some, some ways. Great. Thank you for that comment. I think if we step for a moment into online harassment, electronic maltreatment, cyberbullying, I think one of the, the things that comes to mind for me is, is what is truth. Um, which we've already talked about a little bit. So s there was a study in which they interviewed parents and teens and asked the teens, have you ever been cyberbullied? And asked the parents, has your kid ever been cyberbullied? And the numbers didn't match. And a big question that was raised from that study is, which is right? And I think to me, it, it's a question again of, of perception. If a child feels that they've been bullied, if they feel that they've been maltreated, how do we think about negotiating that situation of 
of accepting whether or not that's, that's truth or whether there's a certain set of standards that we have to subject it to. I think that what's interesting about technology is it takes a lot of behaviors and a lot of things that have happened for millennia, as I mentioned, and puts them in this space where we can view them and capture them and screenshot them and see them. And so I think, um, I think one way to think, to come back to our case is we're not thinking that in all cases of maltreatment that somebody is out there blogging about it. But here we have these few select cases where it provides this additional information. It's not going to solve all of our cases. It's not going to help us in all of our cases. But when there is that information available, how do we think about whether it's ethical to use it? And um, I think that thinking about the idea of what's the culture of what's public and private now, what do people choose to share is one way to think about that. You're next. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, having lived through a case somewhat similar to this, and that was a low point in my professional career, um, I take this to heart. And one thought I had regarding invitation versus seeking, I wanted your, your thoughts, was seeking um, information transparently. Mm -hmm. um, something like, with your child's illness, there's nothing I won't do to try to fix things. And that would include talking to experts, reviewing the medical journals, going online about her symptoms, and going online about her personally. I'm going to do it all to try to fix this. And at least you're out there and you've said you've done it, as opposed to, I think it feels bad to sneak in and say, well, look what I found. Mm -hmm. And this would be a way to, to be transparent and, and to perhaps not completely sever that relationship. And it's, it's just a, a thought. I was wondering. I think, that's, about it. I think that's a great thought, and we like to be transparent with families across the board with any type of maltreatment when we feel it's safe to do so. So one of the things that we think about is in these types of cases, we're very strategic depending on the level of concern around how we intervene with the family because, because there, there is a range. There, there is a range of, there's a continuum of risk and there's a continuum of behavior. And so what we want to do is make sure that there's support for the family and safety for the child before an intervention and that the people who are involved really know how to safely support the child and the parent because, um, and Tom might be able to comment on this more, but when you do address a concern, especially related to illness falsification or, or um, exaggeration, if the, if the parent is on the darker end of the continuum where there's uh, greater risk for safety to the child, it can actually be very unsafe for the child to have that conversation with the parent. So I think the, the art or of this work is consulting with, with child abuse docs who are professionals um, like Dr. Jenny or one of the docs on our team around, here's what I'm seeing, how do you suggest we intervene with the family to help keep the child safe? Transparency is great, but it's not always perfect for every situation. I don't, I don't know if you guys want to comment on that. but. Um, sometimes we look at blogs, in fact most of the time we look at blogs without talking about it with the parent first. It's how we gather information. It also helps us, it helps inform the level of risk because there is a difference between blogging about um, your worries about your child's health and blogging about your child's impending death. We can say as providers that blogging about a death and, and, and then the child may be ending up in the ER two days later with an unexplained episode. At that point, we have a worry, and I think you can do the math on why we'd be, we would be concerned for the child's safety. So I would just encourage you to always consult our team before intervening with a family around what's the best way to do it. So. I guess I have a, maybe a similar question, but actually I like, I like your question. I actually liked your answer. I like your answer. You know, I, I think it's really this question of who should do this, whether it should be the child protection team or whether it should be the clinician. I think it really gets back, begging to your question about the issue of looking and not looking. I, I like the, also like the way you frame the ethics versus the legal part of it. And I want to focus on the ethics part because I'm not a lawyer. Um, but, and, and part of my motivation, like you, I also had a case of this uh, many years ago. I, for s six years, uh, I was a primary provider for two children with s significant cystic fibrosis. And it wasn't until a couple of years later that we learned that their cystic fibrosis was, was really quite mild. And all those hospitalizations were, were very much fabricated. And we just had completely missed it. 
And so I think the issue of distinguishing between real information versus fabricated information, up front, we don't know. And what I found myself wondering about, related to your question, is should we be making a routine effort on patients who th we think have legitimate illness to look on their websites? Because that's the only way we'll find this, because many times we don't have that suspicion. And I think that's the real challenge in those cases. The reason why it took 18 months is because people in the best of intentions didn't put those pieces together, and they might have put them together sooner had somebody seen that. I really appreciate your question, and I wish some of you could have been standing up here and watched some of you kind of cringe. And, and I think it really gets at that, that we're all struggling with what is, what is this definition of public and private, and do we start adding Google searches into our medical record? I think that we're, we've come a long way in the last five years to having more open discussions about this. And many of us are integrating technology into our everyday health care. We've come a long way to having electronic medical records. I think that we're coming along in having discussions about this. And I think one way to think about it is how much time and would it add any risk to that kid to start doing something like that routinely? So maybe to put it in contrast to um, when there's dis when we are worried about children maybe um, for suspected child abuse, the comment was made that we often will get a skeletal survey. Well, for many young kids, that involves um, sedation, that involves um, radiation. So what are the risks to that child, whether the findings are positive or negative versus the risks of doing a Google search, I think. So I think that, that these sort of discussions are the way that we'll be able to make really well-informed decisions about whether this should start to become routine, and then it's very transparent to all families that, that we're doing this. Thank you. Um, I have a question for the SCAN team. Um, I'm Yula, I'm one of the pediatric residents. And um, we have, you know, in my long and distinguished career, I've seen a few <laughs> cases of medical child abuse that are just terrible and they go on for so long. And people are always, well, this family's weird, something's weird about this, but everybody else says it's okay, so we're just gonna track truck on and it takes a very long time until that concern rises to the surface and is <coughs> voiced as such. Whereas for uh, you know physical child abuse, we're always on the lookout. We're always paranoid about it. And then for teenagers, be doing things that are un not good for them, we're always looking for that and we're like <coughs> searching for it. And we want to make sure it's not there. Whereas for medical child abuse, that is something that comes like only when it's like blatantly obvious. And so. What I was wondering is how can we improve our communication in our fragmented care world where there's all these different services and it seems like these families tend to go to all these different services and get referrals for these, all these different interventions. How can we uh, connect those concerns and have people talk to each other and gather that information in a place? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure I have the, the best answer. The, the cases actually that we've been successful or we think we've been successful in, in helping are ones that we've involved the primary care provider uh, really uh, <laughs> solidly in the plan. So what we've heard from primary care providers is that they see these referrals flying by their desk without any um, recognition that they are supposedly driving the boat. And they really, um, really, get concerned about it, but they think, well, the, the child's in the care of specialists here at Children's Hospital and, and that things are all under control and they don't realize how fragmented it can be um, here in, in one institution. So when we pulled the uh, primary care provider in and really funneled all care through the, the primary care provider, it's really helped us. And we've put notes on the chart saying, you know, please funnel all referrals, future referrals to the primary care provider. So that's one way, but I don't, I'm not sure there's, is great. Well, and I'm, I'm just going to add to that. And obviously, I'm not, I'm not a doctor, but I think that um, looking for objective data that you guys observe rather than just taking the parental hi history before you're going to do <coughs> interventions like, like G-tubes or major surgical procedures. I have kids. I can identify with being an anxious parent, but I'm not a doctor, and I would be horrified if I was directing medical care for my kids. Um, because I, you know, I'm, I'm just a, I'm just a worried parent when something's wrong with my kids, and I think that, that we need to do probably a better job of looking for the objective data. And I think one of the reasons why medical child abuse gets missed is it's a really awful thing to think about somebody being deceptive, 
Um, and I think that it's the last place that people want to go sometimes to think that there's a parent sitting in their office not giving them accurate information. So sometimes I think the lack of noticing what's going on is, is um, potentially not wanting to see what's in front of you. And what we found here at the hospital is once we've worked with providers on one case, that provider is educated and has opened their eyes and now can identify in a much better way when that problem is sitting in front of them. And it's usually a lack of objective data and a parent that's pushing for interventions that aren't necessarily indicated. So think about that and talk to other people within the hospital of other services that are treating the child. When you have a concern, it's okay to pick up the phone and say, hey, I'm worried. Are you worried? You know, we can all work together and, and help intervene before things get, get really off the rails like they did with this kiddo. So. It will be the good, uh, the good last question. I couldn't have asked for a better lead-in to my comments. I'm a primary care provider. Had a case like this recently where the kid had sought uh, multiple providers, multiple care, strange stuff. Uh, I picked up the phone and called one of the GI folks here. We talked. We got more information. It was clear there was more to this than met the eye that she didn't know about, nor did I know about from her end. Uh, that resulted in our conversation with mom. You're going to go in and get an evaluation for this kid for this kind of issue, uh, and uh, she didn't go, and so uh, the rest is sort of history. The kid was admitted two or three weeks of evaluation, and uh, so <coughs> old-fashioned technology is also pretty cool. It's called a telephone. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, folks, pick up the phone and call the primary care provider if you don't know what's if, if there's something weird about this, and uh, primary care providers call your specialist and say, you know, there's something weird about this. Do you know that? Uh, and I think if we all use the old-fashioned technology of talking to one another, it might uh, solve some problems. I want to thank everybody for a really thoughtful discussion this morning. Please join me one more time in thanking all our speakers.